and welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Kirchner University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. And today we have a very special episode where we'll be answering questions from parents who have been listening to the podcast. Well, what a very special episode we have planned today. Now, the Research Works podcast, as you all know, has been really focused on empowering and supporting health professionals in being more evidence based. But increasingly, we have realized there have been a lot of interest and questions that have been coming from families and from parents, and they've been tuning in. So we thought we'd just take this opportunity to hit pause and have the opportunity to then just answer some of the common questions that come through to us. So to do that, we have a bit of a panel discussion. So on the mics today, we have myself, Dana, as well as some clinicians from the Healthy Strides Foundation to answer some of these questions that have been sent through to us from the podcast. But I also think that this podcast will be really relevant for so many clinicians as well, because these really are some common questions. So to be able to answer that, there's a bit of content here that you can use and to reframe and have these discussions with your families as well. So let's meet the panel. Welcome to the mic, Lauren West. Hi. Hi, Dana. Thanks for having me. Lovely to have you, Lauren. Tell everyone a little bit about yourself. So I've been working as an occupational therapist for the past three years. Fabulous. And do you like being an OT? I love being an OT. I absolutely love my job. Couldn't imagine doing anything different. That is definitely the right answer, even though I'm a physio and let's just, let's just bias it that way. I love physio. <laughs> okay. To the next one, we've got Marissa Smith. Welcome, Marissa. Hi, Dana. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. I'll tell everyone a little bit about yourself. I've been working as a physio now for 13 years and I actually started working with adults in the hospital setting and then for the last nine years have worked in the area of pediatrics and just love it. That's really cool. So physio for over 10 years, that makes you a little bit on the older side now. It's fabulous. Join the club. Mm -hmm. All right. (laughs) Welcome, Georgia Hoffman. Hello, Georgia. Hi, Dana. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. Well, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. I have been a physio for nine years now and I've worked in paediatrics for majority of that time. Similar journey to Marissa working between hospital settings and community settings. That is really cool. So we have definitely got a great team here just to answer some of these questions that families have sent in through to us. But before we get into the, all the detail and start going to all those little bits, I thought I'd just ask a really quick question because I love a little bit of a fun fun session when we're doing our podcast. I'm going to ask you if you had to have one final meal, what would that be? Really quick. Here we go. Georgia, what would that be for you? Authentic Chinese fried rice and my <laughs> mum's apple crumble. Gosh, it's gone for two there. Not bad. Not bad. Marissa, what would that be for you? Good quality wood-fired pizza with fresh <laughs> prosciutto is a must and oh, a good bowl yum. of ice cream with chocolate topping. Love <laughs> the chocolate <laughs> topping. That's great. Laura, what about you? A really nice well-cooked pork belly and a lemon tart. <laughs> and Dana, we know you like food. So what is your oh, meal God. of Anyone who's heard the podcast and know I talk about food all the time. Like anything at the moment to do with noodles. I'm a noodle girl. I will have any, in any way, in a soup, fried, any sort of way, noodles. That's me. So you know a little bit more about us. I'm sure that was really enriching for all of you. Well, let's get into the actual evidence now and talk about what we um, set out to do to answer some of these questions. Now, to really set the framework of this, we're going to relate all of these questions and the answers back into what research says. So when we know, when we talk about research, we talk about the traffic light system. Now, the traffic light system really outlines what are the green light interventions. Those are the interventions that have the highest level of evidence. They've been shown to be effective. So we should be choosing those interventions to address things that families want us to address, what what the major goals might be. The next level down is the yellow light interventions. They're the ones that probably say you could do it, but you just need to put in some measures in place to make sure you know that's going to be the most effective. And then finally, you have red light interventions. And as the name suggests, red light means that they're not effective. They're all, they're just ineffective or they have too many adverse events for it to be safe for our children. So we'll talk about them with regards to the traffic light system as well. Okay, now that we've got that framework, Lauren, what is the first question? First question is, when do you wear AFOs and is it okay to take them off? Great question. Now, first up, AFO stands for ankle foot orthoses. I've often heard people call them UFOs along the way, but it's most certainly ankle foot orthoses, AFOs. Now, to be really clear about what the purpose of AFOs are, is they are to really support function. They are orthotic that you can see on the child's leg. You usually see it from below the knee and it goes right down to the foot 
and you can wear shoes over the top of them. And there's lots and lots of different styles. But we know that AFOs are a green light intervention, so the highest level of evidence for the purposes of function, for improving walking speed, improving gross motor skills, the stride lengths so of how big your steps are to make them more even, and just how you walk in general because of how it controls the ankle. So research really supports the use of ankle foot orthosis in children with cerebral palsy and light conditions, and that's really important to note. But of course, like with everything, you can't wear AFOs every single day, all through the day. You know, there's all sorts of things you need to consider. And the question always is, when can you take them off? Now, to answer this question, we really need to go by what AFOs actually do do. So we've talked about the positive benefits of them so far, but we also need to consider that AFOs provide this external support. They're, this, they're not part of the body, they're put on top of it. So they kind of take over from the muscles that are meant to be doing the work. So if you put in it over your calf muscle, your calf muscles aren't able to really contract and move and develop and grow in size. And you also then take away the ability to balance on your own because the AFO, this really stiff orthotic device, is taking over from doing that. So those would be the reasons why you consider when you take off your AFOs. So let's go into that in a bit more detail to help you to make those decisions. So Georgia, let's talk about that first. Wearing AFOs often means that you can have these side effects that you don't necessarily want. What are they? When you're wearing your AFO, it does provide some really positive benefits, as you said, in terms of having stability, safety, and yeah. more consistency with walking. But the flip side of that is that because you do have that stability, your ankle is quite restricted, which means that the muscles around the ankle are not able to contract and therefore grow and develop as the child grows. And this means that the muscle is at risk of what we call muscular atrophy, in which in simple terms means that the muscle is smaller and we know that small muscles mean weak muscles. Yes, yeah, so that's such an important consideration, isn't it? So when you don't let a muscle do its job, it therefore becomes smaller in response. It doesn't become as strong. We're all about all about strength, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. Because the strength at, in the calf muscle and all the muscles around the ankle allow the child to be really functional and be able to participate in all their activities of daily living, standing, walking, running, jumping, playing, having fun. Yeah. So again, it comes back down to the goals. AFOs are designed for function. It's to enable a child to do what they need to do and in a better kind of way. So we spoke about how you walk uh, and how you might be able to improve your balance and all those kinds of things. Now, let's go into that in a bit more detail now, because if you've got something to help you with your walking, we often talk about it with regards to energy expenditure. And we know that using AFOs can help to reduce the amount of energy that it takes to walk on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, from an OT's perspective, why is that so important, Lauren? Well, children have many activities that they need to participate across the day. And one of the main occupations of children is, is play and school. And school is tiring. So we want the child to be able to engage and participate and be active and alert at school, which is so important. So we don't want to have to be worrying about excess energy expenditure from not wearing AFOs. Yeah, so that's such a true and again, highlights why you would use it in those settings. So we're really talking about the reasons why you'd use it in a school setting. And then I guess the flip side of that is then what happens when you're, when you're not using it and what the consequences of that might be. So before we go into that, let's talk about energy expenditure a little bit more because I think that's a really interesting topic. So for, for children who would wear AFOs for every day whilst they're walking, we, let's explore why energy expenditure is such a big deal. So Lauren, you know, what does that mean for a child that's used up all their energy from walking and what, that, what does that actually look like in the classroom setting? Oh, it looks like um, not being able to, to pay attention, not being able to complete a task, just slumping in their chair or other, sometimes it can go the other way. They can be overstimulated yeah. and not be able to focus on the task at hand. Yeah, yeah. And I think we can all sort of see circumstances where that might be the case and so wearing AFOs might just mean that you can take that extra energy that they might need and so they can concentrate in school. Okay so if you're wearing your AFOs all the time at school then what would be some of the things that we really need to consider? I think Marissa you've had a lot of experience with this in working with orthotists who are the people who make the ankle foot orthosis but there's it's really individualized isn't it? It's so individualized because like with 
you know, any child with cerebral palsy or other like conditions, no one presents exactly the same. Yeah. Children have different elements. We look at it at body structure and function level, so taking it right back, there's different levels of spasticity and range at each joint. But when we, we talk about function and AFOs are for function, so when you see a child up on their feet, there are always um, need the AFOs that to be specific for them and what we're trying to achieve yeah. and how we're trying to improve their gait efficiency with the AFOs. It needs to be specific for that child. Yeah, that's right. So there's different things that you might have with your AFO. That's why it's so fine-tuned. It's not necessarily something you can just take off the shelf. In some instances, it's okay, but sometimes it's got to be so individualized because you want to make the best opportunity from every single step because every single step essentially could be therapy if you have the right kind of AFO, don't you reckon? Definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think it's just all about finding that balance and the key is really to talk closely with your physio and come up with a plan that allows you to have the benefits of both having the AFO on and having the AFO off. Yeah. Okay. So just really summarize that for, for parents. We do recommend that AFOs are used for function. We recommend that they are used to improve the way that you walk, improves your gross motor skills, reduces the energy expenditure. And we know that because research supports that. Now, it also then has research that says, actually, the traditionally we always used to talk about AFOs, you need to wear them for four to six hours and that number came out and we kind of went, well, we just kept going with it, to be honest, until we sort of stopped to realize why do we actually do that? And we feel like we just work towards this number to wear it. So mm -hmm. instead of looking at a number, we need to talk about function, why they're using it, when they're using it. But to be really clear, the evidence isn't very, very strong in, to, in terms of using AFOs to maintain range of motion. I think we always used to think it could maintain you, your ability to bring your toes up so you don't get too tight in your ankle joint. Georgia, let's talk about that because I feel like this is such a common thing that we you would, would use AFOs to maintain range of motion. But more and more, research has shown it doesn't actually do that. Yeah, so traditionally in, we have thought in the past that things like stretching and wearing an orthosis for extended periods of time, we, well, we thought that it did improve or maintain muscle length, but the current evidence really shows that that's actually not the case and that actually active therapy or active um, intervention and exercise and physical activity is what helps maintain muscle range of motion. Yeah, so it's actually really quite different now, isn't it? So we used to always think, put it on, get the muscle to stretch as much as you can, but actually all those negative effects means that your muscles get smaller and they're not as strong, but you're not actually even maintaining their range of motion. So using it for extended periods of time isn't recommended because you're not using it to stretch the muscle. And I think that's the, that's the bottom line, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So I guess if we talk about that, then it's not being used to maintain range of motion. It really leads well into the next question, I think. Lauren, can you, can you call that one out for us? Yeah, sure. What surgeries to muscles would you expect children with cerebral palsy to need? Okay, this is a really big question, but a good one to discuss within this context because I think there was always so much language about, you know, using AFOs will maintain your range of motion and hopefully prevent you from having to have surgery. But we do know that children with cerebral palsy, they do have spasticity. So spasticity is this increased tone in your muscles that happens when you move it really quickly. And it's a result of having an injury to the brain. So it causes your muscles to be stiff when you're trying to move it. Now, when you have this level of spasticity, it's there. It's a permanent thing that you'll get. It won't get worse, but it's always going to be there. But as you grow, it does affect how well that muscle can actually then be used. So when you consider that as being the factor and then you're using, thinking that AFOs might prevent you from, you know, having that muscle become longer, we know that's now not true. We now know that surgery becomes an option and it's, a, and it's something that we have to consider would be possible in some children because you do have spasticity. So the reason why you would have muscle surgery is to lengthen it, to allow you to be able to function more. So that is the main purpose of it. And that can happen at any point in your life. If, if the muscle feels like it's getting a bit tight, it can happen in any part of the body. But let's talk a little bit more about what then happens leading into that, because there's a lot of prevention that you can do as well. So we spoke a little bit about stretching. So Marissa, I want to summarize the stretching part of it a little bit there. So we know that stretching in terms of maintaining muscle length. There's no evidence to support <laughs> passive stretching, which is such an interesting thing. It's something we used to talk and use quite often in our in our toolbox as such, yeah, but now it's a real red light intervention. There's no evidence to support it, so hence we shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So when we say it's a red light intervention, 
what do we what do we actually mean about that when we say stretching is a red light? I think by red light we're saying there's obviously no evidence to support it, but therefore as clinicians we it's something we shouldn't be using. Yeah, because I think we always used to think we needed to use it. We used to prescribe stretching a lot, and some people would spend hours in their day doing a whole stretching routine, but with no effect. And I guess that's why it's red light. You could do it, but it's there's a, no effect. No, and it's a waste of someone's time and funding. And yeah. yeah. So if we know that stretching is something now that doesn't work, then what else can you do? I think you've got to be able to fill it with something else. And we then have to look at what other toolbox uh, therapies we can actually incorporate. And there's, there's something that's really simple that we can do to address muscles. Serial casting is something that can be used to improve muscle length. And even though it's something that might only produce minor changes in muscle length, it can have a great impact on function. Yeah. So for those that haven't heard of serial casting before, because it's not always used, but it is still, like you said, it's a great tool for us yeah. to remember that we have access to, is when plaster casts are applied to the limbs to stretch a muscle um, for muscle lengthening. In the old days, now about 10 years ago, we used to basically change the cast every week. But we know now the less time the children are in cast, the more time they have to be active mm. and strengthening the muscle. We keep yep. talking about being active. So therefore, we now look at changing cast every three days. Yep. You can get a slight change in range, then recast them in their new range. Yep. Of course, what is so important after serial casting is like with anything with I keep saying active, yeah. is that I come out of the cast, they then need to be followed up with active strength training but to make functional use of this new range or new muscle um, lengthening that they've achieved with the casting. Yeah, it's the same thing that keeps coming back, isn't it? So we do have this great tool of serial casting. It's a great option. It's a green light intervention that we talk about. But the key is not always just what happens there. Once you Once you stretch the muscle, you have to strengthen it. And unless you do that part of it, you probably haven't done enough to, to fulfill all the great things that you can get out of the serial casting. So I guess to really summarize that, that part of, you know, when you take your, um, you know, AFOs off, we spoke about at the beginning, we said, you know, you, would, you wouldn't use it for stretching, but you'll be really active as a result. We know that surgery is something that you might consider in the lower limb if, if the muscles get too tight. And so this would be a great way to get more length. The key is always going to be about strengthening and serial casting might be a good thing that you can use and be able to plan for. Now, we just talked about the lower limb, but of course you can have surgery for the upper limb as well. Yep, that's right. So the same principles apply to the upper limb. So you just want those green light interventions. You want it to be an active, goal-directed, functional rehabilitation program to optimize the effects of the surgery. Yeah, so it's the same thing. So regardless of wherever the muscle is, once you've had the surgery, you then just need to make sure you strengthen. And it's all about using those right principles. And if you do that, it is evidence-based. You're going to get the best outcome in the shortest amount of time and you're going to have better function as a result of it. So hopefully that answers that question. I know we've gone a long way around to, to be able to describe that, but I think it's important to understand um, the why and then the how and what's actually available out there. Okay, next question, Lauren. I have a wheelchair and a walking frame, but I can't bring them around everywhere. So sometimes the wheelchair is at home and the walker is at school, but he likes to crawl around at home. How do I strike the right balance? Gosh, how common is this question? Hey, but I think what it speaks to is the fact that there's different ways of moving and you can use different ways of moving in all different circumstances. So we're talking about a wheelchair. We're talking about a walker. We're talking about the different settings that it might apply in. So Look, to talk about this, we're going to introduce a concept to you that really guides our practice and then helps us to describe someone, but also then helps us to set a goal. And this is called the Functional Mobility Scale, or we love to say FMS because we love our acronyms. You'll hear us say, what's the FMS? So that's Functional Mobility Scale. Uh, Marissa, do you want to just talk through about what that is? The Functional Mobility Scale is a scale that's used to classify someone's mobility over 550 and 500 metres. Now, what's important about this is that 550 and 500 metres, you don't need to necessarily remember the numerical value, but yeah. what it represents. So five is looking at how someone might mobilise indoors. 50 yep. is how someone might mobilise at school. Mm -hmm. And 500 um, represents how someone might mobilise in a community. Yep. Now, we have a number scale we use to then um, score over the 550 and 500 metres. Mm -hmm. So it's one to six. <laughs> we'll go through the six scales. Okay. So uh, one is when a child will mobilise in a wheelchair or is yep. pushed in a wheelchair to mobilise. Two is when a child uses a walker. Yep. Three is when a child uses crutches. Four is a child uses sticks. Five is a child that can walk independently but might have some difficult on uneven surfaces or going up curbs or stairs. Yep. 
And six is a very confident, independent walker who has can go up um, hills and inclines and curbs with ease. We also use C for crawling because, of course, some of the younger children are not going to be able to walk, for example, over an indoor distance, but they can crawl. Yeah. So to give this an example, you might say that a child, um, their FMS is 221. Yep. And all that means is basically they walk with a walker indoors. Yep. They walk with a walker at school, but they also then use a wheelchair to mobilise in the community. So it's just yeah. a quick way of being able to say this is how the child mobilises. Yeah. And it can be used for goal setting. Yeah. So I love that. So you can describe it really quickly and you can really communicate with each other. So if you see those numbers in your reports, that's what it means. So as you describe, Marissa, so 221 describes how someone can function right now. But like you just said then, you can use it as a goal setting. So someone who is, as we will say, GMSCS level three, which means a gross motor function classification system of level three, uh, which means you use a wheelchair and you can use a walker as well. It really pertains to this kind of question that's being asked and you've just described like a two, two, one. It makes sense. But then we can also have something where we can talk about goal setting as well. So how, Georgia, how would you use that as a goal setting for someone? So the FMS scale can, yeah, as you said, provide a snapshot, but then also allow us to set goals with families. And so for a gym FCS level three, sometimes children feel really confident to use their walking frame inside their home and at their school, so in familiar environments, but they may find it really difficult out in the community where it's a little bit more unpredictable and they have to be in their walker for longer periods of time. So sometimes we might set a goal for them to be an FMS 222 mm-hmm. so that they can learn to ambulate within their community and, you know, technically across 500 metres yeah. so that they feel like they can be in their walker for majority of the time. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we can, you can see how we can set it as a goal depending on where the child is at. But I think what's really important, the reason why I've introduced the FMS to you in answering this question of, you know, how to strike the right balance between a wheelchair and a walker it actually all comes back down to energy expenditure. And energy expenditure is actually so important. And we're going to come back to Lauren. Sorry, Lauren, you're going to become the energy expenditure queen here as I keep asking <laughs> these questions. But why is energy so energy expenditure so important as we describe this in, for these children? Yeah, as we spoke about before, you know, one of the main occupations of children is play and school. So for at school, we really want to maximize on those learning opportunities. That's what they're there to do. So we perhaps rather than to be in their chair so that they can concentrate and focus at school and not, you know, get too tired. And then at home, you know, two kids want to play. So we encourage, you know, them to be crawling around or mobilising independently if possible um, because we know that one of the green light interventions is something called environmental enrichment. And basically environmental enrichment means to provide stimulating motor and cognitive environments that challenge the child to explore through different movements and learning opportunities. And yeah. we can really, we're best suited to do that at home. Yeah. So we, we can't even begin to describe how important it is that for someone to have the freedom to be able to move as much as they can. And if you can move as much as you can independently, you are encouraging this environmental enrichment, which means will support your cognitive development as well. So all your your communication skills, your hand skills, it just means you're not holding someone back because otherwise you're talking too much time of just being in one position compared to another. So different kinds of equipment can allow for different kinds of exploration. Definitely. I think it's really important to find that right balance and that not everyone's the same. You know, yeah. we, we, we know it's important to be up on our feet, but a bit like Lauren was saying about energy expenditure, it's not necessarily if someone is so fatigued and we talk about FMS, yeah. we might say, well, you know, you have been going as a 222, so you've been using your walker in your community, yeah. but you're so fatigued, you're not keeping up with your peers, you might have a bit of pain. So do you know what? For a period of time, we're going to bring back to a two, two, one. We don't often like to scale back. Yep. We're not saying don't mobilise, but it's all about the right balance in terms yeah. of energy expenditure and what the child needs. Yeah, I think you've described it so beautifully there. And I think that you can use it on the flip side as well. So we've been talking about, you know, how we can get someone to make sure they've, they're conserving their energy, but it goes on the other side as well. So if we know that there's someone who we think should be mobilising as a two, 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 but actually they are a one, one, one. So they're actually in their wheelchair in all settings. That's also important then to describe what we should be going from that. Don't you, don't you think, Georgia? Yeah, well, that's the beauty of the, F, the FMS because we can find out very quickly 
how much physical activity the child is you know, has access to throughout the day. So it's about really looking at what opportunities they have to reduce sedentary time, so yeah. being in their chair and being able to be up, active, accessing their environment and being able to really freely mobilise as much as possible. So, yeah, if they're starting off as a one, 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 then perhaps we might set the goal to start off that they are confident to use their walking frame within their home and then progress to other environments as they're able to. Yeah, and I think that leads us to the next question really nicely. Lauren, what's the next question? There are so many walkers out there. How do I choose a walker that is right for my child? These are great questions, families, by the way. You've sent them really good ones. This is a big question um, and we're going to try to break this one down for you as well. So let's just be really clear what the purpose of walkers are first. They're often called gait trainers as well. They're the same thing. Either way, a walker is a device that supports someone who's not able to walk independently by themselves with the support that's necessarily for them to be successful. So let's be really clear that walkers are really for function. They're for enjoyment. They're for physical activity. There's really clear reasons why you would have a walker. Now, with that in mind, as that as the absolute baseline, how we choose a walker is based on how we can set that child up, how we set that person up for the most absolute win we can get for them. How can we get them to be as independent as possible, but as successful as possible so they're not frustrated by the whole process? Because like Georgia said before, we want people to be physically active, but in a safe, way and walkers provide that kind of option. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this. Marissa, you know a lot about walkers and the features of walkers. Do you want to take us through really briefly what kind of things you get on walkers? Because there's a lot of different types out there. We're definitely not we're not brand um, you know, biased in any particular way because it's all about functions. We're not here to talk about one particular walker over another. We want to talk about what's going to set that child up for a win. Exactly. There are so many different types of walkers. And I remember even starting out as a physio and pediatrics being quite overwhelmed by the different types <laughs> of walkers and which one was the right one. Yeah. But what I actually realised is it's looking at the child again. It's a bit like AFO. It's very individualised. No one is better than the other. It's all about how it enables that person or child to be supported as they need to be to explore and to get moving. Yeah. Now, a really big feature is often, if possible, having, if you can, and it's if it's the best fit for a child, for example, a posterior walker, one that comes from behind, mm -hmm. will allow a child to be open to their environment. They can go up to different surfaces, play and engage with siblings. But for some children, an anterior walker, so one that comes from the front, may support them better. So again, it's looking at each child. Yeah. And you can have different supports. Some children will need saddle seats or a bolster. Um, some will need thoracic supports or arm props to help um, support themselves in a more upright position. Yep. Again, no wrong or right thing. It's all about providing the support that they need to be up on their feet. Yeah. So when we talk about these supports, the reason why you put them in place is to enable someone who can't be upright by themselves to have the most optimal way to be upright in a safe way so that they can then move around their environment and to walk. That's that's really the purpose of supports, isn't it? Exactly. Because that's what it's all about. You know, we want to get these kids up on their feet. You know, they can engage and interact. And so it's about providing supports that allow them to do that. Yeah. Okay. So then from there, if you can let someone be upright and be supported so they feel safe, they feel secure, we then enable them to spend a bit more time being more physically active. Because really a lot of children who would need this are usually in wheelchairs, right? So we, we actually really want them to be upright so they can have the opportunity to exercise. Now, you know from all the podcasts previously that we're all about physical activity and exercise, but there are some really clear reasons why you would have a walker in the life of a child who's not able to walk by themselves so much. So there are some really clear things, aren't they, Georgia? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, I like to think about it in three categories. Function, so allowing the child to really have access to all areas of their environment, which is especially important when they spend, if they spend a lot of time in a chair and they need to be self-propelled by another person. Enjoyment is especially important. We want to set up our children for success and we want them to be at the same level as, as their peers and be able to keep up with their friends, which we can never underestimate the power of. And lastly, for health, I mean, there's so many benefits to physical activity, which we all know from doing exercise or putting off exercise, uh, sleep, digestion, bone, joint health cardiovascular health and especially, uh, you know, preventing cardiorespiratory disease in children with cerebral palsy, which we know is 
a huge uh, risk factor and we need to do everything we can to keep them as healthy as possible. Yeah. So again, you can see what we, all we're trying to do is enable someone to access the green light intervention, which is physical activity. So gate trainers, walkers are the gateway to enable someone to actually achieve those guidelines that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. So another green light intervention it enables for as well is Lauren, the, the double E that we talk about now. That's right. It's another way of providing a movement opportunity throughout the day. And as we spoke about environmental enrichment before, there's just so much that can be gained from exploring your environment, interacting with your peers or siblings, and just even freeing your hands to play whilst being upright. Yeah, that's really, really cool. Okay. So I think we've answered that one pretty well as well. You just, I guess you get the idea that it is individualized, but the purpose of walkers is for function. It's for health. It's for enjoyment. And we'll do anything we can to get someone to be upright so they can reap the benefits of what we know are green light interventions, which leads really nicely into our final question. Lauren, what's our final question? How do I know what therapies to pick? (laughs) <laughs> That's a good one. That's a really good one. We've spoken a lot already through the, the whole of the question series so far about what the green light interventions are. And really, it just does come back down to the fact that we have green light interventions because we want to pick the most effective treatment we can for children because we know we're going to get the best outcome with the limited resources that you might have. And that is a really important factor. Marissa, let's talk a little bit about this, you know, why, why we need to use the traffic light system to guide us when we're picking therapies. Traffic light system is amazing. I was really listening to that, the one, the podcast you did with Iona Novak, and it really is just such an important, I guess, body of literature for us as um, clinicians to, re- to reference. So yeah. the traffic light system, basically, we know that those green light interventions, there's evidence to support them. And there's something that we, we should be using yeah. with the children we work with. Now, what I like as well, what Iona Novak says, is that we don't just shop and we don't just say we're going to do this and this with this child. It's all about the goal. Yeah. So we come back to what the goal is and that allows us to pick what interventions we're going to do. And in using the traffic light system, we're, of course, aiming for those green light interventions. Yeah. Yes. So so there are some key features of the green light interventions. Let's talk about what they are so families really are clued in on what sort of things to look for. Now, there's a lot of different interventions. They've all got different names attached with it. But the green light interventions have key features, don't they? So what are some of the key features that you can think of right now? That word active keeps coming to my mind. (laughs) That's all we'll be talking about. Talking about it being active. (laughs) Active and being task-specific. The child and intensity, they talk about intensity, practice, task-specific and the child being active. So the child is learning how to problem solve. The child is learning how, learning the skill. Yeah. Um, so that becomes, you know, the, what you hear about those green light interventions like partial body weight support, treadmill training, strength training. Um, they're all, the child has an, an element of being active in all of those interventions. Yeah. And the key feature of that is that it's a very hands-off approach. So it's not relying on a therapist or a person that's doing the movement for them. In fact, what the research does show is that by having too much hands on them, you're actually disrupting the process of motor learning. So that might be that you're trying to facilitate a particular movement where you're trying to get a certain response in a child. So there's When you're doing things like that, you're disrupting the process where the child's learning how to initiate the movement themselves and therefore to practice enough of it as well. So that's, there's some key features there. But the other thing is that's really important is that, um, that it is all very much enjoyable. Now, it's not just a matter of a child being, having fun and being happy, but we know that if you're actually enjoying what you do, you actually want to get some more practice into it, don't you? Yeah, exactly. I think really the key is is making sure that our therapy or our interventions in within the that the parents are doing within the home are making it as motivating as possible for the child because we know that if they're motivated and engaged that they're going to want to do it as much as possible and that really is the the main factor that's going to allow them to succeed. So I always am thinking of new and exciting ways to try and keep our kids engaged. It's actually, it's actually really, really important. You all know it for yourselves. If you're trying to learn something and you're not really that engaged with it, you're just not going to learn it. So it tells you, it gives you a good guide. Your child is your guide to be able to say, what is it they're liking? Because if there are protests and there could be reasons for it, so we need to explore what that might be, but we need to do everything we can for it to be enjoyable. Okay, so other green light interventions. Lauren, can you talk through some of the green light interventions that have all of those features that are really specific for occupational therapy? Yeah, sure. There's a couple of green light interventions that are really specific to upper limb function. So that's uh, CIMT, which is also known as constraint-induced movement therapy. There's a lot of evidence to support that and using 
the child's more affected hand in, in play, so getting lots of opportunities for practice and repetition. Then there's bimanual therapy, so really working on using two hands together in activities, which is really important. And the other one is um, engaging in occupational therapy after botulinum and toxin. Yeah, so again, you've got all these very clear, active ingredients that make an effective intervention. I'm going to really briefly now just talk about the therapies that are not so effective that have been shown in this traffic light system. Some of them are actually red light interventions and it's the key features are very, very much the same throughout all of it as well. It is the key features of interventions that don't work is where the therapist's hands are really on the child a lot of the time. And if you have a lot of that hands-on therapy, you're, you're not allowing the child to actually move. It actually goes against all the neuroscience. It goes against the motor learning principles. And we just know it's not an effective use of time. There's actually better things out there that you can do. So we know that those ones are not so effective. They're really talking about alignment and body and, and how someone looks and, and how they're positioned. And those formats where you really focus on those sort of platforms, they've just been shown to be not effective. There's just better ways out there. So I think it's really important to look at those factors and kind of going, how do I discern one that's going to be effective versus not effective? And it's looking at those key features and they're really contrasting. Green light interventions, really active. It's goal directed. It's really task specific. You really are concerned about whether it's enjoyable and whether the child's learning a new skill and it's all about them. Whereas the non-effective ones is very hands-on by the therapist, less of the child on it. We're really being, you know, we're really the ones trying to manipulate the movements and we're really focused on these really structured kind of movements that we're trying to go for rather than the child's actual task. So I think those are probably the really main key features. Now, I guess the main thing to talk about all of that is if you're ever confused about this, it's just to talk to your therapist and actually ask them what is the evidence of what it is that we're doing. Like I think they're good questions to ask, aren't they, Marissa? It's just to say, well, what should I be doing and, and what is the actual evidence? Exactly. It's so important. You, I mean, you have that relationship with your therapist anyway. You're obviously coming to them for, for therapy and support to um, help your child work on their goals. So have those conversations. Yeah. Why are you doing what you're doing and what's yeah. the evidence to support that? I think it's very important. Absolutely. We're health professionals and our role, our ethical obligation is to provide the best level of evidence for the best level of care. So definitely have those conversations. Well, that is all of those questions. Those are banger questions. Thank you so much for sending those ones in. And I hope that this is able to help you with your conversations with, um, with your therapist and for therapists to have these conversations with your families. All right. Well, thank you so much to you guys for being on the panel and having a chat today. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, it was a great conversation. Well, next week we're back into our usual interview format of world-leading researchers in the area of child health. And I have the absolute privilege of speaking to Annie Chappell, a physiotherapist and a researcher that is known for her work in running interventions in children with cerebral palsy. Now, she's just recently published a series of articles as part of her PhD. So there are so many relevant bits of information here for clinicians to incorporate into our clinical practice. You really don't want to miss this. So we hope you can join us next week. Thanks, guys. And bye. Bye. That was a nice comedy bye. <laughs>